cultivate good habits before a crisis like this strikes or before any crisis strikes this session is not the best of times to start picking up new skills or trying to learn new things the habits of learning and risk taking they need to be cultivated well before the pink slips start getting handed over and complacence in good times coupled with frenzied activity in bad times is an awful approach to life in general so i think it's very important to realize that good habits are cultivated well in advance Welcome to another episode of the People Have Interview series. I am your host Ashwara Jain and let's begin with a quick introduction of People Hub. People Hub is an end-to-end one-view integrated human capital management automation platform, the winner of the 2019 Global Cody Award for HCM that is specifically built for crafted employee experiences and the future of work. We run the People Hub blog and video channel which receives upwards of 200,000 visitors a year and publish around two interviews with well-known names globally every month. And now for our guest, Hari Tian is the head of HR at Big Basket and is known as the startup HR guy. Hari is also a successful author. He's an advisor and mentor to numerous young entrepreneurs and startups. He has co-authored three books back to back Back to Basics in Management, a critique of the fabled management mantras, Cut the Crap and Jargon, Learnings from the Startup Trenches, and Cutting the Bot in North India's Quest for Prosperity. We are happy to have him with us on our interview series today. Welcome, Hari. We are thrilled to have you. Thank you, Aishwarya. It's a pleasure being on your show. Thank you so much. Hari, you've had an incredible journey right from the day you graduated. Would you mind us telling telling us a little bit about your story? So I don't know if it's an incredible journey, but I'll certainly tell you my story. So I have been a quintessential uh, small town boy. Uh, I grew up in a small town in Orissa, where uh, you know, a township where Hindustan Aeronautics Limited uh, had a factory and manufactured big engines uh, in those days. And I studied in a uh, you know, company or factory run Kendriya Vidyalaya. It was exciting because the township, in many ways, was a microcosm of India. We had people from all over India you know, coming there, working, and uh, my, you know, uh, colleagues in school, the other children, also came from different cultural backgrounds. So for me, you know, interacting with people from different cultures, from different parts of India, was in itself an education, and that uh, has proved to be invaluable. Even today, my wife is a Marathi, and I am a Kannada girl. My daughter speaks Hindi. I speak about seven Indian languages. So I think uh, my childhood proved to be very, very, very beneficial for me. I was uh, interested in science, particularly physics, uh, in my school days, and uh, my interest in science led me to pursue uh, engineering, mechanical, and IIT Madras. While I was interested in science, I was also interested uh, in history, in literature. and uh, in subsequent years even during my working years i continued to read uh, you know books from history books on literature and uh, you know i didn't read those with any specific uh, objectives in mind or thought you know that i'll have some tangible outcomes by pursuing my interests in those but i'll tell you why i'm uh, talking about this later on it went on to benefit me in a very tangible way So after my uh, engineering from IIT Madras, I did a back-to-back MBA from IIM Calcutta, and the reason why I did an MBA was not to get a foothold outside of engineering, but to get a holistic perspective of how companies, engineering companies particularly, were run. And uh, I was deeply interested in engineering, and you know, my first job at IIM Calcutta was also picked very thoughtfully. I joined Tata Steel. I worked in the shop floor for eleven years as a mechanical engineer. it was absolutely exciting you know when you see on a schematic diagram a valve when you're studying engineering a valve just a simple two triangles back to back but when you see a 5 ton valve 5 ton valve erected at a height of 30 meters on a pipeline it is absolutely fascinating macro engineering at its best so after 11 years of uh, you know working as a mechanical engineer on the field i moved into hr and my move was i would say very accidental at that point of time we were going through as a company an existential crisis because post liberalization many cis countries were dumping steel at below our costs and therefore we had to do something to restructure to right size cut our costs dramatically 70000 people at tarasi were producing 3.5 million tons of steel whereas 700 people 
in a U.S. steel company like Newcore or a South Korean steel company, we're producing the same three and a half million tons. So we had to do something very dramatically different. So we hired McKinsey to help us with the thought process, acting like as a sounding board for us. And I was part of the core team from Tata Steel that worked very closely with McKinsey. This was largely a human capital problem. And I think I understood the power of the strategic power of human capital in any organization if dealt with in the right way. So at some point of time at Tata Steel, I figured out that that was not the best place for me to work because I was a bit of a rule breaker. I was entrepreneurial. I wanted to work with speed. I did not want to consult 10 people before doing something. So I moved on and I found this company called Daksh. Daksh was uh, a BPO company at that point in time, along with Spectromind. They were the two best BPO companies. And for me, my move from Tata Steel to Daksh was in some ways like uh, moving from a you know, oil tanker to a fighter jet. That was the contrast that I experienced. And uh, I was there at uh, Daksh for some time. And uh, in one and a half years, Daksh was uh, you know, acquired by IBM as part of the contract and part of the deal. Management team had to stay at IBM for two years. I was there at IBM for exactly two years. After which I joined an IT services company called Virtusa. This was a Boston based company and a part of the management team was in Asia and large part of it in Boston. So it was for the first time I was experiencing uh, you know, a global, truly global and diverse leadership team. And that was fun for me. And we you know, eventually listed this company on NASDAQ, a startup being listed. That was a dream come true for you know, most people. It was a dream come true for me as well, listing this company on NASDAQ, took it public in 2007, August. At some point of time, you know, my, the urge and the itch for doing another startup continued. And I moved on and joined this startup called uh, Amba Research. I was there for nearly five years, after which it was acquired by Moody's. And then with Taxi for sure, acquired by Ola and then with Big Basket. At Big Basket, last five years, I have been doing multiple things. Prior to that, the first 13 years of my startup you know, journey, I really looked inwards and uh, focused on building the company that I worked for, helping it scale without the wheels coming off and help it find you know, an exit. But at uh, I, Big Basket, I think I've been able to fulfill myself on many fronts. I have been able to find the time to mentor multiple startups. I'm a mentor at three accelerators like Techstars, Numa, as well as uh, Silicon Road. I've written multiple books. I'm associated with you know, an early stage VC fund, Arkham Ventures, and a late stage VC fund, which is Fundamentum. I'm getting to meet very interesting people and doing a lot of interesting things. A lot of what I write today draws from you know, what I read in my early working days and my student days on history, literature. So I've been able to take examples from history and illustrate management lessons. I never thought I could do this. When I studied history, read history, it was just for fun. I never knew that it would pay back in such a tangible way, you know, at this point of time. So, you know, the lesson that I learned was do the fun things in life. Uh, don't really you know, hope that uh, everything will get you some tangible returns. It may or may not get you tangible returns, but at least you will enjoy the ride while, you know, doing it. So that's broadly been my career. I think uh, when people ask me, did you plan your career? I have always said, you know, I have never planned my career. Every move of mine was an accident. It was a bit random. But then when I look back and I think about it, I realize that there was a pattern. And that pattern was about a couple of things. One is, you know, I was curious. I was extremely curious always since my childhood, trying to get to the root cause of an issue, whether it was studying physics or history or today solving problems about organization and scaling. It's always about getting to the root cause, being curious, asking a lot of questions, innocently asking a lot of questions in the process, helping others learn, helping me figure out new things as well. So curiosity, I think, has been a very foundational element for me. The second thing is I've tried experimenting, which is that I've not shied away from doing things which are beyond my comfort zone, gone out to new industries every time. I've not stuck to any one industry from steel to BPO to IT products to you know investment research to consumer internet to e-commerce. I think I've seen it all pretty much. Engineering, mechanical engineering, projects, procurement, corporate planning, and uh, now human resources. So I think I've experimented. That's been the second uh, component of my you know uh, career. And the last one is associating with interesting people. I've never looked for compensation. It's never mattered for me. I've never looked for promotions, designations. I think those are completely irrelevant. 
associating myself with interesting people from whom I would like to, I could learn a few things and with whom I'd like to hang out. So I think uh, interesting people, staying in touch with them, associating with them and work, you know, seeking them out was what mattered in my career. So these were the three things that really mattered in my career. So I think that sums up in, in a way, you know, what I've done so far, Ashwarya. Thank you so much, Ari, for that explanation. I, I think you've had a wonderful, stunning journey and it, it sounds so gratifying. So, I mean, your experience would have been much more enhanced. Uh, and I, I completely understand where you're coming from, just following your passion and doing things that you just liked without thinking about the consequences, about, uh, you know, fame, money or success. That just was a consequence. So uh, that in itself is a huge learning. And, uh, you know, now that you are into this, uh, into human resources, what do you think are the most interesting aspects of human resources and, and why? So after having spent uh, so many years, close to 20 years in human resources, I've discovered a few things. I think uh, HR, unlike, you know, medicine or law or mechanical engineering or computer science, is not a rigorous body of knowledge. You can't even dream of practicing as a lawyer or as a doctor for even a day if you haven't studied these fields. But you can expect to be reasonably successful in human resources even if you've not studied HR formally. So HR is not a rigorous body of knowledge like law or medicine, for instance, or even engineering. As a result of which, you know, you can find that uh, people who never studied HR can be some of the best people managers can understand how to manage people, motivate people well. Sometimes you might find that your mom or your grandmother or your father may be very good at you know motivating people and you have learned a lesson or two or many lessons from them on how to manage people, even though none of them have studied HR. So HR in some ways, I think, has a lot of common sense. And the fact is that common sense is not very common, like everyone says, it's absolutely not very common. And I think there are two components uh, to a successful HR professional. I just simply call them prose and poetry. The prose is, you know, an understanding of numbers, balance sheet, profit and loss, problem solving, clear thinking, understanding business models. I think that is the prose component of it. A large number of people who formally studied HR have actually done HR because they wanted to run away from this component, which is such a crucial element, I would say, in managing the people function. The second component is poetry, which is understanding of human psychology, the softer elements. A lot of HR professionals don't seem to get either of them very well, as a result of which they end up doing a lot of admin related stuff and saying the very standard things. So I think to be very effective, you need to have a good understanding of both the prose and poetry of HR. And therefore, I have found that uh, the best HR folks or the best you know, people managers are those who get these and don't have to necessarily come from an HR background. I have not come from an HR background. Many folks that I have seen have not come from an HR background. So I think HR really is about a lot of common sense, understanding the pros, which is clear thinking, you know, understanding business fundamentals, e and you know, balance sheets, clear thinking, those components, as well as a deep understanding of human psychology and how to get the best out of people. It's about being able to figure out what kind of people or human capital programs or initiatives will help you accomplish your business objectives? Establishing that linkage, understanding it well, I think is about being a great HR professional. Absolutely. And it's, it's amazing how, you know, it's just really a unique blend of factors and, you know, you, you need to learn how to really uh, manage or, or just understand human psychology, which makes it so interesting and and the way you put it is so interesting and you know there is another aspect to it which uh, which is technology so according to you how much should we invest in technology for a function like human resources i think uh, technology is an important component of every function every function has some grunt work some clerical work some structured and repetitive work i think a lot of that needs to be automated and if you can automate all of that, then you know, people in the function can focus on delivering value, on doing some of the most strategic stuff that you know, machines can't do. So I'm a strong believer that you know anything that can be automated should be automated. 
anything where technology can play a role and make life easy, you should use technology. And I think technology is finding a place in every function. And it's finding a place in HR as well. So you have a lot of HR MSs which are getting more and more refined, sophisticated. You know, you have conversational AI bots in place. So I think uh, a lot of it is already happening and it continues to happen. It should release the time of HR professionals, you know, to do some of the things that uh, they were supposed to be doing in the first place. So I think it helps uh, in a big way. Sure, absolutely. Also, you know, talking about uh, startups, you have been, you know, heavily involved in uh, managing startups. Um, you have seen a lot of leaders coming up. What advice do you have to give to the new age startup leaders uh, who have taken a pause now due to the pandemic and due to the financial crisis? I would very broadly like to say, you know what, cultivate good habits before a crisis like this strikes or before any crisis strikes. The recession is not the best of times to start picking up new skills or trying to learn new things. The habits of learning and risk taking, they need to be cultivated well before the pink slips start getting handed over. And complacence in good times coupled with frenzied activity in bad times is an awful approach to life in general. So I think very important to realize that good habits are cultivated well in advance. A lot of expenditure, you know, wasteful expenditure is incurred by individuals and companies in good times and they undertake desperate cost-cutting measures in bad times. I think this is a sign of poor character. I think this applies for startups, it applies for individuals as well. In the context of you know, startups, high growth companies have seen that there's a wild swing in focus between you know, reckless growth followed by an equally blind push for profitability at a later point of time. I think that is not good in any way. So I think companies and individuals that have a tendency of displaying such wild swings in you know, these kind of behaviors are less likely to bounce back from crisis and those that you know, do a balance between the two. So I think that's very critical. So I think startups, you know, some of them, I've seen them very closely. In good times, especially with the well-funded startups, have built large, uh, unwieldy and wildly expensive teams. And some of them went on to acquire, you know, went on acquisition spree by hallucinating, hallucinating synergies that never existed in the first place. So many of them are in trouble and are having to resort to, you know, large scale layoffs at this point of time when the crisis has struck. But startups that were a little more thoughtful in terms of hiring and built costs with a lot of, you know, thought, consideration and after a lot of discussion, they are the ones that are able to handle, you know, the crisis a little better. So I would say that if you have been stuck by a crisis, you know, this is the time to rethink it is the time to you know revisit some of your beliefs your approaches and to figure out you know how you would manage things when things uh, begin to return to normal how you will start cultivating some of those good habits which will stand you in good stead so if you've been you know having some of these good habits in the past i think and if you have been impacted by this crisis bouncing back would be a little easier and you would not so badly be impacted as well but if you've had those bad habits if you are now hit badly this is the time to you know think back and introspect and figure out how you do things differently if uh, things were to get back to normal. Absolutely, I think startups that have stayed lean, have stayed prudent, are yeah. really reaping the benefits at this point yes. in time. Uh, but the ones that have gone extravagant now are suffering. Yes. And uh, you know that that kind of follows into my next question. So a lot of startups that finally grow into you know uh, bigger organizations, they go yes. through a lot of dynamic uh, shifts, right? So. Uh, you know, with respect to uh, leadership and with respect to culture, uh, what do you think are some changes that come into place and uh, some of them can also be, uh, you know, an adversity, a factor that's negative when you grow into larger teams. So how do you maintain that culture of a startup, but still, uh, you know, ensure growth and performance in teams? This is a great question, but uh, I don't know if I can answer this in such a short time because it's a very, very, you know, elaborate response. But let me try and keep it short. So I would say that, you know, startups go through different phases as they scale from being a startup to becoming a mature company. 
and people who studied this have identified five different phases that startups go through each phase you know requires it to change in some very fundamental ways so for example on the first stage of growth is called growth through an idea where the founder just has a very disruptive idea but nothing else they, the founder may not even have management skills to give feedback management skills to hire maintain a team conduct interviews but if the founder learns some of these skills the founder is going to get to the next phase of growth the startup gets to the next phase which is growth through direction where the founder begins to tell everyone that this is the way we do things in our i won't take you through all these five phases but i can just tell you when startups go through different phases of growth each phase is different from the previous phase and is different from the subsequent phase it's important for founders to recognize these phases adjust some of the leadership styles figure out what are some of the larger implications of these changes and how to deal with these changes so i think that's very critical in terms of culture i think culture is something that you need to maintain even as you scale while the phase change at each step you know will mean different things what is going to be constant is the culture that you have built so culture is very very foundational that's not something that's going to change as you scale so for example i would say you know very few people uh, really and deeply understand culture so culture is about demonstrated behavior it's about the kind of behaviors that are rewarded recognized every day it's about the behaviors that are penalized it's about what leaders in the organization or the startup do every day irrespective of what you say what you do matters what you say nobody cares about you can say that we are the most customer centric company in the world you know print uh, you know beautiful posters and hang them on your board rooms and you know meeting rooms but if you don't demonstrate customer centricity nobody is going to believe you so a thousand ceo speeches are less impactful than one single demonstrative behavior so i think it's very important even as you scale even as you go to face changes even as you evolve to maintain that culture and the only way to maintain the culture is to live it every day by example demonstrate that by example every day build it into the performance management process where leaders who demonstrate this culture get into the next level get into bigger roles while performance on other tangible business metrics matter cultural you know alignment is also very critical and that should be taken into consideration when evaluating people for key roles and evaluating overall performance as well so that broadly is my response but i can give you a much much longer response that that will take forever sure sure thank you so much for that i think uh, as you said it's important to not just hang it on your walls but live culture every single day of your life uh, in in offices uh so so i'm going to wrap this interview up by asking last question if you have any other important sound bites that you'd like to leave our viewers with nothing particular all i would say is that um, we are going through extremely difficult times of this and just now these kind of times you know never come more than once in a lifetime of a person i have never seen this i don't think i've never seen something like this ever again in my lifetime we've seen 2008 we've seen you know 9 by 11 but they were no at no way comparable to what we are seeing today today we are seeing something which we don't understand which is a pandemic we all understood the credit crisis we all understood nine by 11 but we don't understand how this is likely to unfold so all i would say is that uh, you know be stay positive hang in there if you are impacted use this time to you know think about your approach to life find your purpose and meaning in life and figure out how you're going to bounce back when things uh, begin to get back to normal Wonderful. Thank you so much Hari. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for the enriching and learning experience. Uh let's keep Thank in you. touch and uh have a safe time ahead of you. Thank you Ashwar. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.